I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Eric Haddock, CEO and President of InsideTrack.com. Welcome to the show, Eric. Oh, thanks for having me back, Jim. It's really hard to read the markets right now. I've had one person tell me, that they actually believe the big drop in January and February was enough of a correction to give us a healthy market again. Well, I, I suppose that the best way to, to view that, at least from my perspective, is to go back and really review what I've been saying I expected out of this market uh, since February of 2015, and and the market continues to validate that, so I'm still going on that same premise, and that is that a a developing bear market in 2015 and 2016 would look remarkably similar to uh, how the market acted in 2000 2001 before it was really recognized as being a a full blown bear market and and I'm referring to the Dow Industrials here uh back in 2000 2001 the Nasdaq 100 made it very clear right from uh the first few months that it was in a bear market but it was a lot of the other indices that were being very um very disguised about their intentions and there were multiple times during that two year period where uh the market did see a sharp sell off and by many standards uh it would have been enough to correct an overbought market at least for a few months but the subsequent rallies wouldn't quite make it to new highs and then all of a sudden another decline would take hold. In fact, I kind of did a, uh, a an update on this just in my May newsletter and and then also talked about what it meant going forward. But just a couple of the the, the high points there comparing the two time frames. Um, in 2000, you saw the Dow Transports lead all the others by about uh, nine to ten months, and in 2015, same thing happened. Transports topped in November of 2014. Most of the other indices topped in May and June of, of 2015. Uh, in 2000, the Dow Industrials uh, experienced two sharp declines in the first nine months of that, that period that I'm talking about. And the second low was pretty much equal to the first low, uh, accounting for an overall 17% drop. Well, in 2015, uh, almost identical. The Dow Industrials saw two significant declines in the first nine months of the bear market. Uh, second low retested the first low, and that is the, the January low of this year retested the August low of last year. And the overall drop was 16%, so almost an identical pattern, almost an identical percentage drop. Uh, looking back to 2000, 2001, after that second low, uh, the, the Dow rallied about 15%, rallied just under three months. Uh, here in 2016, the Dow rallied a little over 15% and right at three months. So again, very closely mimicking what it did back then. Uh, in 2000, 2001, Dow consolidated for a few weeks, gave a quick spike high, and then uh, entered a sharp six-week decline. Uh, here in 2016, Dow did very similar, 
and most of the indices peaked right on that April 19th, 20th date that we talked about in a previous interview, what I call the date of aggression. And uh, they've given indications of a new decline. And I have been saying all along that there's this five-month and ten-month cycle, both of which come together in late June when I think we'll see the next low. Between now and then, I think we're going to see another sharp decline. So the point of it all is that uh, we are looking more and more similar to 2000, 2001. And you can even step out of the markets and look at the, at least in, in the U.S., the geopolitical structure or the political structure itself. And, you know, when was the, the most controversial uh, election we've, we've seen in the U.S. In, in a generation or more? It was the 2000 election and we're, we're gearing up for another very controversial election here. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what type of um, surprises come out of it. So there's just a lot of parallels that I don't think should be ignored. And then there's some specific trigger points that I could see uh, being hit in the next, really in the next couple of weeks that would validate uh, that scenario even farther and tell me that we're in for another decline similar to uh, early 2001, uh, before the market really showed that it was in a full-blown bear market. How is the economy connected to the markets, or is there a real connection anymore? Well, that's uh, that would take uh, a lot of experts far more knowledgeable than me to answer intelligently, and so much of the market's uh, is built on expectations and perception. Uh, so, you know, it depends on which part of the economy is, is the focus. And what I'm really looking at more than anything for these, these shocks that we've seen in the market is, um, I'm now looking outward a bit as many analysts are, but, you know, China and Asia um, their markets and their economy have really been the ones uh, leading some of those uh, those shock waves. And when we saw the drop in August, when we saw the drop in January, uh, they coincided with some sharp sell-offs in um, Shanghai Composite and other I- indices in China. And the interesting thing to me is that those indices, and also when you look at the Hang Seng and the Nikkei, um, they really have not rebounded much from their January lows, and now they've been heading back towards those lows. So even though we're looking at the Dow and the S&P and others being up near their highs again, You've got these other indices that are very close to a uh, another tipping point, and it's when you go through those levels that you get the sharp accelerated moves that create a domino effect. You know, for two, three, four months, no one's looking at any correlation or any connection, and then you just get that one more salient, more noteworthy uh, move uh, break below support, and all of a sudden, uh, everyone's rushing for the exit doors at the same time. And I think that a lot of those Asian indices are getting much closer to that um, that watershed time when we could trigger another quick, sharp sell-off, just like uh, we saw in August and then in January. And often the, you know, the economic, uh, figures almost follow that. You know, it's often the, the tail wagging the dog type of thing. Uh, you get consumer confidence and then spending and, and other things suddenly turning down. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So there's, there are definitely connections there, but identifying the exact cause and effect and, and a perfect correlation uh, is is very difficult to do. Now, China, of course, is a newcomer to the idea of a free market or free enterprise. 
has their attempts to correct their market actually mess things up even more? I don't know that I could uh, intelligently answer that because although I watch their indices and uh, treat them very uh, carefully as as some uh, warning signs and yellow flags, I have not done a lot of research into their whole uh, structure. I don't know if it's made things worse, but it certainly helped to create what appeared to be a bubble in their in their market and from the sounds of it in their in their real estate uh when you talk about these ghost cities that they have throughout China and uh it's like so many uh newcomers you know it's even when you talk about the uh, the tech market back in the 90s and 2000 um that was the the new and and popular thing that uh went far higher in its ascent and far lower in and a more sharp descent uh once that bubble burst and so you it's just a a ongoing sequence of um of ebb and flow highs and lows and in some cases bubbles and and crashes and I think that their market has certainly set the stage for that. Uh, and it doesn't even mean from their perspective, uh, it may not be as bad as some of the, uh, residual effect that it has on, on other markets that were kind of banking on the China miracle, uh, as being the, the saving grace. And I think that you would see, um, markets in, in Europe, because they're so precarious that they may be the ones to really start to accelerate lower once once China has its next dip uh, and and the U.S. close behind. What about uh, the experiment with negative interest rates in Europe and Japan? How has that worked out? And how has that affected everything else? Well, I think that that has just, uh, contributed to the same thing we're talking about and, you know, every different things, even about how that, you know, in many respects penalizes savers and penalizes the, uh, the generation that's, uh, needing to, to pay for all of the other, um, programs and problems that are, are in the market. And I think that that the experiment with negative rates will be an ongoing debate for for several years. But uh, not being an economist, um, again, it's one of those things that I don't know that I could add much to the uh, discussion that's already out there. Well, what I've heard is it's created uh, such a weird market that they may not be able to crawl out of their problems. Yeah, and that's the thing is is you know, when it becomes necessary to start raising rates, uh, there's now no longer any wiggle room. And it's kind of like a, a couple of years ago when, uh, when the ECB initiated, um, some of their version of QE and basically came out while that was happening. I believe it was Draghi and saying that this was it. This was all their ammunition. This way he didn't phrase it exactly that way, but it was very clear that, um, you know, this is all we got. And, you know, it's kind of like from a geopolitical uh, perspective, the whole debate about uh, assigning an exact deadline when you're pulling your troops out of a um, an area, all that does is notify everyone on the other side uh, that that once you've hit that point, that's it. There's there's nowhere else. You've just eliminated every possible other option you have, uh, or at least you've stated that you've eliminated them all, and you're going to have to really go back on your word if you if you start if things don't go exactly as you hoped. In the most optimistic scenario, now all of a sudden you're in a far worse position because you've uh, so pigeonholed yourself. And I think that um, I've talked about it before, but I think that we're also entering the time 
when cyclically speaking you're going to see another inflationary uh, pop in a lot of commodities and in precious metals and what I've talked about as a food crisis and I'm not saying a, a complete um, shortage of, of food as we know it. I'm talking about the things we've seen on a regular basis where you get some, some crop stresses and then there's a domino effect that, that goes through the markets and all of a sudden certain key crops uh, escalate in, in value and in cost and, you know, a healthy market can absorb that. But now we're to the point, even where some of your key grains are at, you look at, at soybeans uh, in the $10 range. Well, that, that $9, $10 range has kind of been a floor for the last couple of years, whereas for many years and decades it was more of a ceiling. So now you're starting out, you're basing at a much higher level, and all of a sudden, they're starting to uh, get some some stresses on on different crops around the world. And when they inevitably go into another sharp rally, um, and you get inflationary pressure starting to hit the markets, and then you get the Fed, you know, ultimately thinking, well, gee, this is where we we might need to start raising rates to rein in some of this price inflation. There's no leeway to do that because the, the whole system is so precariously close to to the edge of the abyss, and so it is uh, a very uh, limited, uh, narrow uh, space in which to operate and in which to try and tweak the market. So I, I do agree that that's that's placed the whole system into a, a very fragile and uh, a very dangerous uh, position. I mean, what about just natural population growth? Has that been a factor? I mean, you know, uh, with the uh, population load we have now in the billions and billions and billions, and it's growing, what kind of a strain does that put on the whole system? Well, I, uh, you know, I think that that's something that, uh, again, it it just puts you closer, or or it eliminates a lot of your wiggle room. And you know, as you have more demand for food and for natural resources, for oil, uh, for all across the gamut, um, you know, the uh, the suppliers and the farmers and the uh, oil oil men are all struggling to keep up with that now right now we're looking at more of a glut of oil because of things like the the expectations for china not uh, not coming to fruition but with other natural resources uh that um, have a a shorter shelf life and a narrower um time for for raising them in the case of crops uh you don't have as much uh, wiggle room and and so you're uh, it just I'm just reiterating the, the same thing which that population growth continues to stress is it puts you in a more precarious position where it takes far less of a stress to trigger a um, a snowball effect of First, escalating prices, and then all of the ramifications of that throughout the market, and that quickly hits your your equity markets and and everything else connected to that. We'll have more with Eric Haddock right after the break. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture ticker symbol Amy A M Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome back. We're speaking with Eric Haddock. You mentioned stresses on the system. The wildfire that swept through Fort McMurray, Alberta, uh, has cut their production of oil by about 40%. 
a million barrels a day. Is that enough to affect the world market? Well, all you have to do is look at the uh, the price to see what impact, and it's been pretty negligible at this point. Uh, you know, often it takes two or three of those type of stresses to have uh, that that synergistic uh, domino effect. That um, you know that's happening uh, right as you're really dealing with a lot of glut in the market and Iran coming back online and a lot of other factors that mitigate it right now. Uh, but, you know, if you, if you suddenly had one or two similar stresses on oil production or oil delivery, uh, that's usually when you get um, the big moves in the market. So just looking at the, uh, the markets themselves, which I, you know, follow each day, you can just look at a price chart and see that it's had a little bit of impact, but uh, nothing that significant up to this point. Of course, the Middle East is always a, a keg of dynamite with the fuse ready to be lit at any time. And, uh, you know, if a super tanker was hijacked or something like that, that would add to the Fort McMurray thing, wouldn't it? Yeah, that could. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm even thinking of events that might have a little bit longer lasting effect and, uh, and farther reaching effect. But yeah, there's, I mean, there's always the possibility for uh, multiple things like that, and you can you can speculate at, at dozens of possibilities. Um, the the interesting thing is that the markets often give you very revealing clues uh, as those things are developing kind of under the radar, uh, which is why I'm such an advocate of technical analysis because usually there's some significant entity that is aware of a smoldering, festering issue before the masses have been informed of it. And those entities will be making their moves in the markets and hedging or speculating on on a perceived outcome. And the charts reveal it long before it hits the news cycle. And once it hits the news cycle, everyone's trying to get in at the same time. So... Uh, I just kind of stay on top of the markets and uh, and look for those those clues ahead of time. But there's there are literally dozens of things that could uh, compound the effect of something like that, or um, the the fires, you know, eventually get under control, the production resumes, and and there hasn't been a a dramatic effect. Right. There's so much oil sloshing around in the world, you know, losing a million barrels a day. I mean, I thought we had a surplus of a million a day. That just brings you back to even, doesn't it? Yeah. What about gold? I've heard right now it's probably due for a bit of a correction and will climb at the end of the year and be tremendous. Well, I'm here again. I go back to uh, what... We've been discussing the last year or so and, and what my analysis has shown for the last five years. And that is that 2016, that, that buyers should have been waiting until 2016 and then looking for the first significant advance, uh, right at the outset of the year. Um, but that the year as a whole, I was expecting to uh, to be the first and second phases of a developing bull market, and the first phase being up, the second phase being a, a pullback of that initial advance. Uh, so I am certainly looking for more upside out on the two- to three-year horizon. I don't know that an all-out uh, ballistic move is, is likely uh, still in 2016, uh, but if you're talking a two to three year period, then yes, I'm, I'm definitely very bullish on that overall time frame. Um, my, my outlook for this year was a three to six month surge to begin the year. And the ultimate, 
uh, the, the most important upside target for 2016 in gold was 1305 to 1315, and in silver was right around the $18 uh, mark, both of which were just hit as as gold and silver were fulfilling uh, the cyclic analysis for a, a big April surge right around that date of aggression, that April 19th, 20th date. Uh, so they have fulfilled a lot of the three to six month upside expectations. So I could certainly see a uh, an extended period of volatile consolidation here. Uh, and and while that's going on, I think the dollar has one more rally, probably to new highs before the whole dollar advance is done. And once that peaks, that's when I think you then get prepared for the bigger, more extended advance in gold and silver, uh, because then any threat of dollar strength would uh, steadily be removed and, and and free up one more bullish factor to impact gold and silver. But right now, uh, there's some key expectations I have for the month of May. Um, we already got a very short-term sell signal uh, last week, and like I say, that's just a, a one- to two-week uh, sell signal, but there is... Um, both in gold and silver, some key uh, patterns setting up that as soon as um, May 13th could trigger a more of an intermediate sell signal. So we're definitely in that time frame with, with upside cycles being fulfilled, upside price targets being fulfilled, and now some short-term sell signals being triggered where it could escalate into something a bit larger than that, but uh, I need the markets to to tell me that is definitely the case and and to um, escalate the, uh, the sell signal that uh, we got last week. Eric, thank you very much for chatting with us. All right, great, great to be here. Thanks for having me back, Jim. My guest has been Eric Haddock, CEO and president of InsideTrack.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our popular YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Questions or comments for the show can be emailed to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.